Are you wishing you could get more organized and focused for 2020? What about setting and achieving that special goal you've been dreaming about? What if you actually plan to get it done this year? My talented shift design team has created a beautiful planner that solves the problem of having to carry a bulky planner around or of having your digital calendar disappear on you or be unavailable offline. Our 2020 Get Your Shift Together fillable PDF planner has a calendar, planner, notes pages, inspirational quotes collection, multicultural dates reference, and it syncs across devices. You can print it up or have it on your devices for reference everywhere. The planner is hosted on a platform you can come back to and features monthly productivity one-page tools to keep you focused and clear on what you want to achieve this year. Even better, I am supporting all the planner purchasers with once-monthly short tutorials on how to use each of the featured tools so you know exactly how to get the most benefit from them and you feel supported in your goals for the entire year. For only $17.99, you can grab your 2020 Get Your Shift Together Planner and start your journey of being blissfully productive right away. It's only available until the end of January. So to get yours now, go to shiftworkplace.co slash digital planner. That's shiftworkplace.co slash digital planner and click add to cart. Welcome to the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Today, I am really honored to interview a guest who impressed me the first time I spoke with him. In fact, he impressed me when I first heard what he had to say on LinkedIn. I just had to have a phone call to find out more. And I continue to be impressed. His name is Steve K. Young. And he is someone who has quite a lot of experience in high-level thinking and management that comes from within, without, and really understands context, rolling things up, rolling things down. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. So uh, Steve has an MBA and has his PMP. He's an educator. He's a consultant an executive and coach who is passionate about leadership and building high-performance teams. Through his experience as a student athlete with the University of Alberta Golden Bears hockey team, as a police officer for 18 years, university lecturer, consultant, or as member of the Alberta legislature where he served as the chief government whip, Stephen's understanding across athletics, politics, academics, government, and business provides a broad perspective on the challenges and opportunities of leading and building successful teams. Stephen is currently the CEO of Garnet Instruments, a lecturer at the Alberta School of Business and instructor at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. He continues to consult with businesses on aligning their strategy, processes, and tapping into their most valuable corporate assets, their people. So that is a really impressive bio, and I really have enjoyed the conversations we've had so far and looking forward to the one that we have today. Steve, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's always weird to hear your own bio, but uh, I appreciate the kind words. It is odd, isn't it? You listen to it and you go, is that really me? Who is that guy? (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I'm going to ask you to just fill that out a little bit because that's the formal part. But I mean, tell us a little bit about you as a person. Well, and you asked my wife, she'll agree with me as well as I'm all over the place, but I like doing cool things. I like changing things, making things better. When I was at the police for a lot of years, it was a lot of fun, uh, cops and robbers kind of stuff and dealing with people. But I also got an opportunity to engage in the strategic level of stuff and building community policing models and uh, responses and resource allocation strategies and all those kind of things. And then, of course, uh, I had the uh, unfortunate circumstance of getting elected to the Alberta legislature. So that was an interesting experience as well. I joked to my police friends that uh, as a policeman, you wear a a trauma plate in the front and politics, you wear it in the back uh, because it's a very dynamic and... uh, environment to play in but it's a real opportunity to do some really good things province-wide so I really enjoyed that perspective as well and uh, of course everything seems to always relate back to a sports analogy somewhere so I always think back to my coach Billy Moores at the University of Alberta Golden Bears which uh, the principles of leadership and success uh, are really served as a thread throughout my uh, career and whatever I did whether it's like now I'm doing manufacturing and teaching at the university these uh, these principles seem to always resonate uh, and be consistent throughout whatever I'm doing so many managers and c-suite people and owners they all have an experience with a coach or several coaches that really help to form their idea of how to lead 
And it's really interesting to see that. And sports is very useful for that. If you had a good experience with being on teams and having great coaches, it's a great analogy for how to move human resources. Absolutely. One of the most resonating things I, I tell this story often is that uh, Billy Moores and Claire Drake would say to you, he says, we're all on the team. We're all equal. We just have different roles. And so his, I'm the role as the coach. I decide who plays. You're a role as a player and you're in to be a player and to work hard. And so that really resonated me with me in terms of value is equal throughout the organization, but just distinguishing the different people in the organization with different roles and not in terms of difference in importance. And so that perspective really has driven a lot of building teams. How do you build a high-performance team where there's this class structure of importance? I, I don't think you can, but you can build a high-performance team where there's a, where there's a difference in roles. It's the unity and diversity principle. As right. you're moving forward, but everybody has a diverse role, like different parts of the human body. You wouldn't want to have 25 hearts. You know, you need different parts so that the whole can function more effectively. You don't even want to say that your fingernail is worth less than your brain because all you do is rip your fingernail and you go, whoa, this is preoccupying me for the whole day, you know, and, <laughs> and imagine life without fingernails is very difficult. So it's like every person in a team plays an important role. Absolutely. And so that it doesn't matter whether you're on a sports team, which is a great analogy of life, but it, it also translates into my role here at uh, Garnet Instruments where we're manufacturing and we have different people playing different roles from the servicing of the equipment to the operation of the equipment to the procurement of the equipment. Because if there's any one of those things that isn't come into play, we're not operating or quality suffers or efficiency suffers. So those all need to work together. In manufacturing, you really feel interdependent. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you may not see the importance in one person, but if they didn't show up, all of a sudden everything stops. And then you just realize the role they played and, uh, you know, whether a part isn't here or a piece of equipment is down or an operator who has a specialized skill and training around operating a piece of equipment doesn't show up, then, then everybody suffers. So... So that leads into other things we do in terms of uh, create redundancy and uh, risk management around having cross-training of people and we create committees to help uh, support uh, and collectively um, share in that. So it's not, you know, we don't have people who are, I'm just worried about myself and do, you know, you're worrying about the collective, but you're performing on your role. So that's sort of the, what we found to be successful, uh, particularly the, the committees uh, that we've instituted here at Garnet, which is, was, was new. Uh, and it allowed people uh, throughout the organization to sit around the table and talk about stuff that is organizational focused and contribute in a way. And the incredible buy-in that you get from allowing people to participate and engage and, and some jump up and take uh, leadership roles and whether it's a chair of a committee and it, it's, it's impressive to see people develop that way. And uh, um, like I've heard you say sometimes when you get all these processes in place, you can, it's, it's wonderful because it allows me as the CEO or the director of operations to sit back and start focusing on organizational strategy stuff, not tasks or different mandate challenges from day to day because the committees are taking that role. You know, I just want to jump onto that one thing that you said about committees because I'm really interested in it. Uh, in many organizations, they don't discover where they have single points of failure until something goes wrong or somebody goes missing. And so then that's an opportunity to figure out how you can avoid it. But very few ha that I've ever met think of putting a committee together to make that work. But that gives you an opportunity to build capacity in a small group and to see where people's talents that have been latent could be hidden, right? Absolutely. You got to be careful because committees, I mean, we've all sat around a committee that have been wasted our time. And you always got the guy who, let's add up how much is this committee time cost us? You'll add up the salaries around the room. And what have we done? Is it actually worth that? Uh, so you always got that into the thing. It's not all committees are good. They need to be focused. They need to have a clear mandate and they need to have an agenda before the committee meeting and they need to have minutes after. So you have this efficiency. It's not just people going around a table and sort of navel gazing and talking about things. Good leadership requires a clear structure. Exactly. And that, and without that, it, it just becomes this idea of a waste, a waste of time that uh, you, I've been to a lot of committees, especially in government, there were a bit of waste of time. Uh, but we can say we had a meeting. Uh, yeah, we didn't accomplish anything. Uh, but uh, so that's within Garnet, we've been able to have these focus committees. And if we have nothing to meet about, uh, it's going to be a pretty quick meeting. 
Right, right. In drama, there's something about meetings called a meeting of people when they're speaking called building and blocking. And in a meeting where everybody is working towards uh, an agenda with a specific goal, they start orienting themselves towards building. But if you don't have that, people talk in circles and they just block each other. And I've often thought that a little training in improvisational drama, learning how to build instead of block, would be useful for a lot of people who tend to go on and on on their same opinion train. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the structure of a committee is, is critically important. The role, that a strong role who, of the chair who knows how to manage the committee and, and allows people to, to speak and not get spoken over or blocked is hugely important. But if you want to do a deep dive into committees and you know, this whole thing about the group dynamics and all the different archetypes within the committee structure you typically get, um, they always say in any committee there's going to be one jerk. And if you don't know who that is, it's probably you. Uh, but <laughs> that's great that's so quotable in every committee there's going to be one jerk if you don't know who it is it's probably you or, or i'm just going to play devil's advocate which is an important role but it can become dysfunctional and some organizations have empl- employed things like myers-briggs to, to understand that dynamics and there's always a note taker and somebody wants to play the devil's advocate but all these different roles if everybody's working towards a collective and an authentic direction can be very very uh, valuable far better than some lone savant sitting in office by himself putting together a plan. It'd be good, but good luck in trying to implement that with because you've got no buy-in, you've not engaged anything. One thing I learned in government when I was we're doing legislation and stuff as an MLA is uh, you don't give a solution to problems people don't know they have. So first thing you've got to do is market the problem, engage them, and then we have a solution. There's another quote right there. I love it. Listen, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because this I'm, I'm really uh, getting interested in what you're saying, but I wanted to ask you to just go back into your childhood a little bit because you're really great with uh, explaining yourself and telling about ideas and giving super metaphors and quotable quotes, but let's just find out how you developed all of that. So as a child, can you think back on an incident or two that were formative for you? Well, you know, I was never uh, very good at academics. I was always more interested in sports. Uh, I wanted to play in the NHL and everything else was plan B. So that was really my focus of my goal was to uh, play in the NHL. And I remember being in, in Long Island, New York, and I, they wanted me to go back, go to some East Coast League team. And I said, you know what? I have no education. I'm going to go to school. So it was really at that moment that I just changed from totally focusing on hockey, which the reason I got as far as I did, which is not that far, was because I worked hard and was interested in how organizations work, how processes work. And, and then when at the University of Alberta with the Billy Moores, it was, there's a system to play hockey and you need to stay within that system and processes. So the value of systems and processes create this structured, fertile ground for individuals to perform. I'll tell you another story. I was working with the, these folks, uh, it was security guards who were working on uh, Churchill Square and we were police officers and I was so unimpressed with how they carried themselves. They dressed lovingly. They, were, uh, they didn't have the confidence. They were poorly managed. And I actually thought quite poorly of the security guards that were operating in, in the same areas that we were. And then the next year, a couple of those security guards were actually with the, came over, were recruits with the Edmonton Police Service. And they were awesome. I said, well, what changed? It wasn't the individual. It was the level of expectations, the standards, the management. And so you put people in those environments and they can be very successful. So when I'm looking at change management of an organization, it's easy to sit, to point your finger at individuals and say they're not performing and that's why we're not doing well. And you stand over them with a, with a whip and say, go harder or do better. But that isn't the way is, that's not the road to success. You got to look at the organization, its structures, its processes have objective standards and measures, and we've all heard about data tracking and all that stuff, but even the most basic levels, and then people will rise to the occasion. And if they don't, then you have clear objective, not value-based judgment, but clear objective measures to say, hey, your quality is not where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. And so let's, how do we get you there? And then you go down the road of training or, 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 or supporting that. But just simply saying you're bad and work harder is, is just 
doesn't do anything but de demoralize people. Yeah, you're, I, you're talking I, about creating a climate for success in which the entire organism can grow and then pinpointing little pieces that need to be worked on, right? It's easy to blame somebody as opposed to look at yourself, look at the organizational shortfalls. But I'd like to go back. You must have had a childhood before you were in college. So anything that you were engaged with as a child that you think was formative that helped you, for example, one of the people that I interviewed talked about how um, when he was a child, he made a big mistake and his mother actually turned him into the police for making that mistake. And that's when he realized that he was going to be accountable for all of his actions and he was going to live that way. So that was an important moment for him, right? Um, another person spoke about uh, going to his grandmother's funeral and she was really a small person in the community who seemed to have no status, but there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were there honoring her at her death. And that was formative for him. So is there something in your childhood that you can trace back to that you think was formative for you? Well, I'm reluctant to talk about issues with my mother, otherwise we'll get down the road of Freud, but uh, I, <laughs> my parents were wonderful. But one thing was pretty clear throughout is, uh, you know what, whether people are watching or not, uh, you do the right thing. And my dad would say simple things like, we don't do that, you know, in terms of thinking of bad behavior. It wasn't a speech. It was just, we don't do that. And so there's always this level of freedom, but this principle of being right and being ethical and accountable was always there. So I was never encouraged to go in any one direction. I was able to find my own way. Yeah. So I, I was always had the freedom to decide where I wanted to go, but uh, there was clear principled ways that I had to explore on my own. So when I played junior hockey in the Western Hockey League, I was uh, affectionately known as a power forward. Uh, so I got l lots of penalties. <laughs> and But I got traded a few times. So in about a four-year span, I lived with 13 or 14 different families. And so which gains you, a, looking back, I really see a whole degree of self-awareness and interacting with people was really a lesson for me uh, when I was 17-year-old who really you know, you're living at home, you don't care. But now I'm going from family to family just because I got traded or what have you and from year to year. And you really get this sense of self-awareness and realize how different people were. When I was a policeman, uh, you get to see every walk of life. I worked on the drag downtown for 10 years and everybody's a person. They all have a story. It's not like bad or good. It's just they have challenges. And just like the challenges of the wealthy, the poor have challenges as well. They're just living a set of circumstances. They also have choices. And they have a culture that they, uh, they live within and where they're comfortable. And so recognizing and having that awareness, I've always sought out things or experiences that broaden your perspective. And I can't think of a benefit of having a narrow perspective. You, you may have to make a choice that focuses in on something, but to have a broad perspective on people and processes and businesses and economics and culture is, uh, I think, a very valuable thing to have. I think you learned that from the experience of being with different families and meeting different people in different socioeconomic circumstances that you said everyone has a story but you also realized that everyone has a context and you started to look for that context in business to see where it was anybody that's not aware of that is going to be creating their own thing and trying to drive it without understanding the context so it seems to me that those stories that you talked about had a lot to do with learning to be sensitive to context did i get that right yeah there's a term called ethnocentrism you know, where we, we judge other cultures or other ethnicities based on our the values and principles of our own. I sort of say there's a certain centrism that we all have in judging other people. We're judging it from our own experience. And you don't realize the incredible challenges that somebody has gone through to get to where they are. And to sort of stand in judgment is, I think, something we should avoid. I, it doesn't do anything, any value to judge somebody, but to sort of understand is a far more laudable principle to achieve. You know, I just... I've listened to a whole series of uh, recordings by Byron Katie where she talks about judgment. And she says that we all judge as human beings. We can't stop it because it gives us a benchmark or a place on a continuum from which to move forward or backwards, depending on what we do, or to stay stuck. And so her approach to judgment is to say, okay, I am judging this person on this basis, right? And mm -hmm. then, is that true? And then she goes, can I be absolutely sure that's true? And then she asks, uh, you know, what does this, uh, if I couldn't, how do I feel when I believe that that's true? And then the fourth thing is, how would I act towards that person if I could not even think that thought? And then she switches it around to an opposite. 
So it, it could be her instead of saying so-and-so is always late. It'd mm-hmm. say, I am always late. Wait a minute. Am I always late? When have I been late? Are there times that I've been late? You think about that sort of thing. Like, so mm-hmm. it helps you to really understand where this is coming from and then see it in yourself. And you've mentioned that before, how, you know, look back at yourself. If you want to make a change, look at yourself first. And I think that that seems to be a principle. The reason I'm bringing all of this up is because it seems to be a principle that you live by in the way that you work. Absolutely. If you're, and even with listening, and, and, and so if we're always quick to judge, and we do have to judge, right? I mean, as a policeman, I was judging all the time. You know, people, you can't judge me. I feel, well, actually, as a policeman, that's what I do. I judge you. You're a criminal and you're under arrest. Like that's that thing. And there's not too many places in society where that's actually that discreet. But if we're actually listening and we're too quick to judge and not sitting back and listening authentically to what they're saying, like trying to hold that judgmental reservation and just be there with the person, listen to what they have to say and put off your judgment until after. If, if you have to make a decision or a judgment, then do that. But, but often we're sitting judging somebody just on, as they are speaking, we're judging. This is good. This is bad. They're good. They're bad. As opposed to just judgment-free listening to somebody. And that's a skill that I've been continuing to practice. Yeah, it's, it's actually one of the skills of intercultural competence. So yeah. it is suspension of judgment. So it's not that you don't ever judge. It's that you are aware of the fact that you're judging. You bracket yourself and go, wait a minute, what don't I understand? What don't I know? What questions do I need to ask? How do I need to listen more deeply to find out where this is coming from? I got, of course, a sports analogy for this. Uh, (laughs) uh, Billy Morris, we were running this drill at U of A, and we uh, were top team in the country, college, and they still are the best program in the country. But uh, So we're doing this drill, and we really screwed up the drill bad. And Billy is intense. And so he calls everybody in and he's just intense. He goes, okay, I am sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't explain it well enough. <laughs> let me, please let me try and do it again. And he's just like, so he's pointing in with all the intensity of a competitor. He's pointing at himself first. And he went through it slowly and explained how the drill works. Well, everybody's like, oh my goodness. It wasn't him. It was us. That's what everybody's thinking. But so we did the drill. We did it perfectly. But that was the probably the most poignant demonstration of leadership that I've seen. It's easy to yell and point. It's way, way harder to look at yourself first. And you still sent the message. And we still got the message and, and of course, performed at a high level. But it wasn't about, what are you lazy buggers doing? You guys stupid. And I've had coaches like that, lots of them in junior hockey, right? Sort of kick the garbage can. But that really uh, emanated with me, and I've applied that to similar circumstances that I've come across. Well, that's a sign of a true leader, humility. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest people are the most humble. And, you know, willingness to put yourself under and say, what did I do to make this problem worse? Makes everyone want to jump in and say, wait a minute, it wasn't you. We're all going to try harder, right? And as soon as you start lambasting people, they just back off and try to protect themselves. And we got to also do self-analysis of what, where does our source of authority or power come from? And if it's always, I'm the expert, then you, if you're the expert in the room, then nobody can tell you anything. Right. And you can't ever make a mistake. So if you have made a mistake, you just have to keep pretending you haven't. But let's get back to one other thing here. So from the groups that you've been born into, right? You've been born into certain groups, a certain culture, gender, a time in history, right? So the groups that you've been born into, what aspects of those cultures has influenced you, would you say? I mean, you talked about sports culture, might be your family, might be the fact that you're in, a, in Alberta. Uh, could be, you know, what groups that you were born into have influenced you? Well, we all check up certain uh characteristics like you said i'm a male a white male living in alberta I played hockey i mean i mean become a little bit uh, stereotypical like it almost paid a picture of myself uh but uh, you know what i the sense of team uh, is has been a dominant thing whether as a family or you know, there's a team people have different roles and responsibilities whether it's in hockey the sense of team roles and responsibilities shared objectives and policing certainly the same thing and when you're trying to build teams within organizations or committees there's got to have those foundational things so that would be the thing that i think regardless of where it is i tend to gravitate to team-like environments i don't enjoy just being uh, an individual performer like some people do, I'm purely accountable to myself. 
I mean, we all like parts of that, but generally I, I want to be part of a bigger thing that I can share with other people and who can maybe fill in the gaps where I'm not that good and I can fill in other gaps where they are. They, they need some help and support, but collectively we're better. Like even your dad saying it when you were younger, we don't do this. That implies we as a family are a team. We That's, as a society are a team. People who are doing the right thing are a team. Even that one simple statement. Absolutely. And uh, that theme has always gone through my career. So I always look to find partnerships, find friends and those collective groups. It's so easy. Like I, I went and played hockey with the Calgary Police Department. They needed some guys to play at the World Police Fire Games. And I didn't know them. But So I show up. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Here I, and I played with this uh, Calgary Cops uh, in this hockey tournament. I was pretty confident that I was going to fit in. Like, you know, they they were all from the same sort of uh, group that, you know, policemen that play hockey. You know, it's all, it's easy to fit in. Where it might be a little different, and I've had some experience of this, and you get into different cultural groups. So I've done a lot of good friends in the Turkish community and, they're, and understanding how uh, the different religion, different histories, uh, different practices all these kind of stuff. And so you see how you become aware of how that group works. And so you got to, you can't just take this cookie cutter and sort of, well, I'm going to, but I do like the group environment, incredibly supportive communities. That brings me to a question a, a little bit further down, but I want to ask you since you just brought it up, because if you are familiar with the Turkish community, so then that is going to, you're going to have some experiences where you felt that there was a cultural disconnect. You're going to go, wait a minute, the way I thought people did things is not the way this group does things. So mm -hmm. can you think of one of those experiences? Nothing specific is coming to mind, uh, but they, I know how I approach it. I don't try to blend into their community. Like, I don't try to, like, just sort of, hey, I'm, I, but I certainly understand it and respect it. Like, they have uh, religious practices, uh, they're Muslim. I don't pretend to be Muslim, because I'm not, but I certainly know how to respect that, and I, and I do respect how they practice their religion and follow that and the principles of their religion. And we have some great conversations about the differences. So it's, it's a fascinating opportunity. But they're also not trying to pretend to be Christian Albertan guy like me. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having actually a disruptive experience to yourself. Because it's really easy to always say, oh, I did this and it worked out well. And then they did that. And then we worked well together. But at, I'm, I'm really talking about more. I had a disruptive experience when I was in Japan. When I was growing up, my dad's best friend was Japanese. And I grew up eating with chopsticks and eating Japanese food. And I thought I was just going to fit in living in Japan. I did not. I had such a visceral reaction to some of the foods that I couldn't even eat for a few days. Um, and, you know, I already lived in different countries before, right? And I thought it would be easy for me to be able to find some way to fit in with Japanese culture because I already had a number of places where I was connecting. But those mm -hmm. places where I was connecting was connecting to an individual who was an immigrant, who was an outlier in living in Canada. Not mm -hmm. the same thing as being in Japan, where everybody is the culture that's there. And I was the one who was on the outside. And it was tough for me. Like I really had to rethink myself. I thought I was just this open-minded person. And I realized I had all of these restrictions I hadn't even known about. And I really had went through a self-questioning process in that. So I'm wondering if you've had an experience oh. like that. You know what, I, I've been to Turkey, I know it's very different, but I didn't have any real problems. It was sort of like, you know, trying to understand the differences, but they keep bringing you food and I keep eating it. So there was a perfect relationship there. Were you visiting or were you living there? No, just visiting. I was yeah. on a, So when you visit, you don't typically have a disruptive experience. Right. And I, although we were in family homes and had that a uh, little more uh, of an experience, but to have those disruptive conversations, I actually got to bite my tongue lots on political issues. I was a politician. And so it's like the old saying, you, you shouldn't talk about uh, religion and politics. Well, I'd rather talk about religion any day uh, because politics has become so polarizing and judgmental that it's far better to just not share your opinion. But I, at the same time, I don't want to just surround myself in this sort of self-validating echo chamber of my own ideas. I want to sort of have a conversation on things. So that's the real challenge I'm finding these days. And it's in the corporate environment. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if other people have that same experience, but certainly as a politician, I've been labeled as this or not that, or this is what you believe. I say, well, why don't you ask me? But it becomes difficult. I'm just going to push you a little harder on that one more time. Push away. <laughs>
<laughs> Sometimes the disruption is a feeling of familiarity that you didn't expect. For example, my family were Baha'is. And the Baha'i faith came out of Islam. And when my daughter, who was in music and art history classes in her undergraduate degree, when she was in one of the history classes, and she was listening to the music, and she was watching the art for the Islamic culture, and then the next class she went into was for Christian art and Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So she realized that she knew nothing about Christianity, and she had a whole lot of insights into Islam that she didn't even know she had and that she felt more familiar with the architecture the art and the music because there was that influence in the background from her baha'i experience she was amazed by that and then my son on the other hand went to a french speaking country for an international youth year service and he went you know i'm just like i never learned french properly these people speak french so much better than me why didn't you make me speak french and i said to him you nobody could make you do anything you were a pretty headstrong person right and he said, I just realized that I thought I was French, and I'm not. So my daughter thought, she didn't think she knew anything about Islam, and she thought she knew something about Christianity because she grew up in a Christian culture, and she didn't. So she was disrupted, right? And then my son thought he understood French, and he realized he didn't, right? So I'm going to ask you if you have something like that. Well, I talk about religion. You know, I did a bunch of reading on Buddha, and so Buddhism really resonated with me. And uh, I've come to understand that it is not a necessarily a religion, more of a teaching and a philosophy. So, uh, and then I was quite surprised when I was studying Islam and the history of Sufism in terms of how that is, they're so closely aligned. And even Christianity has a foundational stuff of Buddhism. Like, oh, mysticism. It, the mysticism. Mysticism is in every religion. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of... Uh, putting a fence around all these different things and you realize there's a thread that of uh, principles and values that flow through a lot of them and so i also with my close relationship with good friends who are muslims i, I find that people who don't have that uh, experience with uh, the religion ignorance allows you to be ignorant and say things are completely wrong right like they you know the media portrays it in a certain way and there that's does exist but to have that as your dominating uh, experience is not beneficial and not reflective of the true uh, principles i also found this when i was a as a policeman working many years downtown um you come across different groups and they never invite you to their birthday parties or their wonderful celebrations they invite you to sabbings and <laughs> domestic debuts and all these kind of things. And so you can get this tainted view. And if you actually use that as your evidence, you could really get cynical. And then as an MLA, I had quite the opposite. Of course, I didn't get invited to the stabbings anymore. Um, it was, you got invited to the cultural celebrations of the different, uh, you know, uh, the Sikhs and the Hindus and all these kind of wonderful celebrations of humanity that are sort of manifested through their religion. It's just unbelievable. And so if you, again, go back to that perspective thing, if you can expand your perspective, it gives you a little sense of appreciation for different cultures religions people i would say you're seeking to understand yep i'd exactly. say you're seeking to know get closer to what the truth of the situation is right it sounds to me like those are two dominant narratives that that you would apply on a regular basis as part of your leadership style i always uh would take in and listen to everybody I spent many an hour talking to the Jehovah's on my front porch. I've also talked to the Mormons. And I talked to them all, okay? And I sort of take it like a, le a lawyer would say. I'll take it under advisement, right? So I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but I'm listening. And so that's uh, same with uh, in an organization. Uh, a lot of people talk about an open door policy, uh, and they really mistakenly think it's actually about the door when it's about <laughs> are you <laughs> – are you are you open to be have a common consider people comfortable coming in and talking to you and say i got a problem you got your door can be open all day but if nobody walks through it you're you're missing the point that's another quote it's just <laughs> great yeah <laughs> well tell me uh tell me steve a little bit about uh how you believe your temperament would have affected the way that you approach your leadership style so 
you you know, people are born with certain qualities and certain drives, and that would be part of their temperament. And then the things they acquire over time and the way they respond to challenges would help form their personality. So I'm just really kind of interested in what you would identify as being your some of your the qualities of your temperament that you were born with. Well, when I was playing hockey in Portland, Oregon, uh, I had a whole section behind the penalty box that had signs all the time that called me Mad Dog Young. So I had a very <laughs> aggressive kind of temperament in sport, but still an inquisitive mind. I like to think now where I've evolved since my youth, my this sort of quick to judge anger kind of thing has been temperamented to a, a suite of responses that are appropriate to the situation. That's sort of the narrative where I'm working towards. We all have a default that has served us well, but it's like trying to golf around a golf with only one club. You're, it works really good on the driver, but not so much on the putting green. So you need to have those things that you can respond and, and intellectually respond to. So there are times at work here, I don't suffer fools and I'm quite decisive. And uh, we had to let one guy go the other day and it was extremely decisive. Other people, not so much right? In other situations. So I strive for my aggressive kind of maybe sort of a thing to now I have a suite of tools. Sometimes I need to be understanding, supportive, and that type of thing. Probably not going to get me to cry, but nonetheless, I'll be somebody who, like I said, suffer no fools and responsive and exacting on a decision. So that's, I guess, how my long answer. It's like quick to respond, take action, passionate, driven, right? But then your personality part would be looking at all this because you didn't want to go out and hurt people. No. You wanted to understand contexts. You wanted to seek the truth of a situation out. So you developed all those other tools until you had a whole golf bag full of different clubs you could use depending on the circumstances. You might have started out with one, but now you have maybe 20 and you can pull them out judiciously. Yeah. To get that close? Yeah, absolutely. There's ways of responding. There's ways of being and I want to have a multiple ways of being so I can actually look at it as here's a situation and this way to respond will be the best. Ultimately, if I believe in people, I, you can develop people or support people or find a position or place in an organization where they can succeed. And what are the best approaches to achieving that? Our owner, uh, he is uh, an incredible uh, engineer. And recently we've gone through a whole extra, he doesn't like managing. And that doesn't mean he's a bad person. That means we're going to put him at doing engineering because that's unbelievable. That's the core of our business. So why would we put him in a situation that's not really comfortable for him, but he feels like he should do it. So we've had that conversation as well. Me, I'm not so good at engineering. You know, so <laughs> I'm not going to pretend to be. So, so you need to find places for people. You need to respond to people in different situations uh, that is best, most appropriate. So let me ask you another question about groups that you have joined. So, you, I mean, okay, you joined hockey. Mm -hmm. That's a group that's obviously influenced you, but let's not talk about hockey because let's, let's look at some of the other groups. So being in the police was yeah. one. Um, working maybe with the Turkish community would be another one. Uh, you might have also had most adults who have children have been influenced by some of the things that their children said that were profound for them, right? So I'm thinking what groups, or even if, if we can't think of a group, uh, individual experience have, have you, you had that you think allowed you to ad adopt or become more flexible about a new cultural behavior? I'm just going to give you a little bit of, a, of an example just so that it, it makes some sense. So I have a lot of experience with the Persian community. And one thing that people do in the Persian community when you walk into the room is everybody stands up and you greet everyone individually. Okay, you go around the circle, you greet everybody individually. And if that doesn't happen, I feel like there's something wrong. Whereas before, I just thought that was weird. But now, in any situation that where there are not Persians, I feel like I should go greet with each person individually and make sure everyone feels valued and that and you don't start until everyone's been properly greeted. And it just... When that doesn't happen, I'm just, I just go, this is just wrong. I, I can't handle this. You know, like it bothers me. So I've adopted it into the way I, I think and want to do things, even if I can't always do it. Has, have you adopted anything like that into your behavior? Well, I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter. So my views on many topics is maybe a little more traditional. Not as traditional as my mom and dad's, but nonetheless, I have an opinionated and a strong, intelligent uh, daughter who uh, on different topics. And, and so I got to temper what I say or have uh, conversations that uh, respect her perspective on things. So I've had to sort of change my default way of 
being with her. I'm not telling her what to do. Like she's 16. Like she's very, very smart and intelligent. And so because of politics was a dominant thing for many years. One time I was kind of shocked where she uh, says, well, you don't like, and she referred to a particular political leader. And I said, and I was kind of heartbroken because I've always had this idea that I was open. And so it kind of hurt my feelings. And so I, I said, it's not that I don't like that person. It's I don't like the policies or principles that they're advocating for. And some of them are good and some of them aren't. And so I really summed up that position with my younger daughter as well. I said, don't talk about parties and individual politicians. Talk about issues. But the fact that she said you don't like that person and that it hurt you means there's something there. Yeah. It challenged my personal belief about myself that it wasn't about liking people. It was about their actions. Maybe you were coming across that way. Yeah, and then that's what I, re- I recognize. Like, for example, like Trump. Like, don't even go there. Yeah, and I'm not going to go there either, even mm-hmm. now, is but nobody's talking about any particular policy. I says, okay, you don't like Trump. There's lots of evidence to support you. Uh, mm-hmm. What policy in particular? And then it, things fall off pretty quick. That's true, because when you start looking for where's the policy, where are the principles, what are the outcomes, that's when you stop being able to judge people in the same way. You may come up with the same judgment in the end, but at least you have some more objective, nothing's ever 100% objective, but some more objective data to base it on and to detach yourself from the emotion and the story that's attached to the emotion. So in the last election that I was running and unsuccessfully, I knocked on this door and uh, came across this fellow who I helped through a medical issue and uh, when I was an MLA, uh, prescriptions and everything else. Like I went bend over backwards and I managed to help him out personally, very significantly, not by changing legislation, but just finding a pathway for him to basically cut his prescriptions from like thousands of dollars to like 125 bucks. Wrote me this wonderful letter. Thank you so much. So we go knocking on the door. He goes, hey, it's Steve. How are you doing? Oh, thank you so much. Wonderful. All right, shake your hand like politicians do at door knocking. And then the guy I was with stayed and says, so can we count on your vote? And he goes, I don't know. That really broke my heart because it didn't matter what I did. What matters in the political realm anyways, and this is true today, is the party and the leader. Too bad. People should vote with their conscience. If he were voting with his conscience, it would have been different. But if he's voting because it's based on past ha- voting habits or party allegiance, that's, then that I know people do it, but I'm saying it's not helping. Well, we're going into an election here right away, and I guarantee 90% of people, I would say 90, they don't know who they want to vote for. As they look down the scorecard, they'll see the party affiliation, and that's where they're going to put their votes. I really appreciate people who actually look to the candidate. There's great candidates and bad candidates on all parties. But if the candidate doesn't matter, it really is a sad commentary on our democracy. Yeah, the candidate has to matter. At least from a personal perspective, I want to matter. Yeah. If uh, what I did, and doesn't matter how hard I worked, uh, you know what? They went down the line, they looked at the party that they wanted, and they chose the one based on the party, not on anything I did. So. But you know what? There's this very famous prayer by Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Where she said, you know, people are going to mock you for doing the right thing. Do the right thing anyway. I love that. My dad too. We don't do that. We do the right thing, right? That's right. So it doesn't matter if they acknowledge you, if they vote for you. What matters is that you did something that helped that individual. That's what matters. And that's what you live by anyway. And the rest is just ego. And it's gameplay I and mean, politics. It's, you know, this whole idea of social license to operate and all this kind of stuff. I said, I don't believe that's effective. But I do believe, regardless, you do the right thing. Don't try and do it because it'll appease a group. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Exactly. There's another conscience piece, right? And if it appeases them, good, but it's not the decision point. Right. So one more question. Let's say somebody was hiring you, and I think that must have happened recently uh, because you're working as the manager of Garnet Instruments. So uh, if somebody is hiring you and they said, hey, you know, what do we need to do to just make this a situation where you really can work in your potential, where you can work according to the way that's best for you, what would you tell them? I need to know what the mandate and the KPIs are and what the sort of score, what does success look like to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a process and I will get you there. I like the flexibility. So for my job, 
you'll always get an email back from me no matter what time of the day it is. And that's not a, maybe a good thing. My wife doesn't think so, but I'm always available and working on the weekends at a coffee shop. But so that flexibility for me is very important because I got lots of things on the go and I'm sort of, that's where I work best, where I'm, I'm not the guy who is, comes in the door at eight, leaves at 4.30. I worked in something all day. I'm more of a management by walking around, a handful of projects on the go, but clearly focused on delivering on what the mandate and objective is of my role. Right. So I understand very clearly the mandate, the objective, and what the desired outcomes are, what, what success looks like, and then give me the freedom and flexibility to go do it, right? Right. And then I'm having this go through annual reviews <laughs> and coaching reviews for all the staff. And I'm going to have conversations about the difference between a mandate and a task. Mm-hmm. And so certain people in leadership positions, they have more of a mandate than a task. And so that mandate has performance reviews, organizational objectives that we're judging your role by. Other people who are um, on the production line say they're going to have task-based measures and that not less of a mandate. I mean, we want them to know the mandate and support that, but that distinction between uh, a mandate and a role. So some people come, what can I do next? I go, well, you have a mandate to take care of this body of work. Take the initiative, be creative, figure out how we deliver that best because you're in the best position. I'm not in that best position because I'm not on the floor or uh, hands-on with that particular uh, function. So you are in the best position and you know the mandate, so just get us there. Again, if we go back to your hockey metaphor, each player doesn't wait for people to say, okay, go, now go chase that puck. Nope. If they did there, it wouldn't be much of a game. So, you know, like once you know what the mandate is and you understand the rules of the game, go do it, right? Yeah, we went through that. We had a mandate at, at hockey, we, what we were going to do that year. Uh, of course, every year it's to win nationals. And then they have systems and say, we're going with this system and you know your role within that system and you're expected to perform in that system. So that's uh, similar within manufacturing. We have a system, a process, and we want you to perform within that mandate or that, that function that you, that you have. And for me, I really like the freedom to deliver because sometimes I'm going to knock it out of the park on one day, other days not so much. But over time, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to achieve all the, the measures that are required. Right. That's so a- this has been really interesting. I really, really enjoyed all the things that you had to say and the many quotable quotes. Cool. And just uh, at the very last question is just basically, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Oh, that's like the last question when you do an interview and interrogation of uh, in policing too. <laughs> but, this is where they prove themselves guilty. You know what? I, I just think that uh, uh, it's a journey. Uh, my experience in leadership and management and business process has been a journey. So there is no answer. And so it's been a continual evolution of trying to gain perspective and to uh, understand processes and adapt. So you can come up with the best thing, but you also need to be able to pivot So, uh, as the environment changes. So I've really, over time, recognized, I mean, my, I had a fairly simplistic view of what management leadership was, and that both of those have continued to evolve and grow through each experience and speaking to people and to having been, uh, had unfortunate things that go happen and have wonderful things that happen. But it's that, having that confidence and that you're it's a journey of learning uh, is what I really feel that has uh, helped shape where I am today and I hope tomorrow I'll be more insightful than I was uh, was today that's really all we can hope for <laughs> yeah but you're, but you're having that confidence or are we there yet are we there yet kind of attitude or focusing on a title that is I think limiting as opposed not are we there yet or says we're doing great what can we do next it's, it's a possible. milestone, yeah. a milestone a in the journey. journey. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. And I'm um, looking forward to, to speaking with you again soon. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. That's not how we do things. Were words Steve's dad used to remind him that his behavior needed to be rooted in a family ethic. That family ethic was doing the right thing, and that was his group identity. Steve Young is a great example of how to use structure and principle with attention to context for leading a team. His sports and political experiences offered him multiple and frequent contexts to explore the extremes of human motivations and behaviors, 
equally comfortable working with criminals as a police officer, helping youth develop their leadership skills, or assisting his constituents with accessing lower cost medications, Steve has become a collector of stories and a source of quotable wisdom we can all benefit from since he lives his principles daily. I enjoyed how Steve explains his problem-solving orientation of first looking to yourself as the single point of failure and then finding the flaws of a system rather than shaming and blaming team members. Always on his own journey to continuously deepen people and subject matter learning, Steve sees himself on a continuum of life, on the team of human diversity, where everyone plays an important but different role. It was great fun to interview Stephen K. Young, and I hope you will look up Garnet Instruments, the company he manages, for transport liquid measurement solutions. Watch for Steve's upcoming book around the principle of effectively using the strengths and styles of your team members. He is thinking of calling it the Panda and the Coyote. Intrigued? More about the book later when we have more details to share. The Culture and Leadership Connections podcast has a mission to help people understand each other across difference and to find bridges of friendship and knowledge for a world of happier workplaces. If this message resonates with you, help us reach more people by sharing the podcast and by giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you have ideas for speakers or would just like to send a personal message to communicate your thoughts on the podcast or about any particular episode, you can email me at marie at shiftworkplace.com or leave your feedback on our Work and Culture Facebook page. Thanks for listening and may cultural connections continue to broaden, deepen, and inspire your world.